LSCC's Megan Gilmore here, Executive Director of Lark Song. I am really excited about this month's skill refresh and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I'm obsessed with the soul. Then we're going to talk a little bit about flow and how this well-being facet of engagement works in our brains. And then we'll talk about what that means practically for some things you can do with your clients. So when I was a freshman in my bachelor's degree psychology program, I went into a course called physiological psychology and I was really excited. I got in there early. I think that probably all the professors at my school had gone to some sort of faculty training that year that said, hey, give all of your students a three by five card and have them write their name and um, something about them or their favorite candy or what they were hoping to learn from the class or something on there as a way to get to know them, uh, as a way to kind of keep track of them, especially for larger classes. So I had already done this. I'd had a few other classes already. I'd already done this three by five card thing um, a few times. So I go into physiological psychology and I wait and I wait and more students get there and we're waiting for the professor. And he comes barreling in about five minutes, um, five minutes late for class, which kind of put me off <laughs> at the time. He had a very mad scientist vibe about him, uh, stacks and stacks of papers, this mug of coffee. It looked like he hadn't slept in probably three, four days. And he came in, gave us three by five cards, and he said, I want you to write your name on one side, and on the other side, I want you to write your definition of the soul and its function. And I remember getting really angry <laughs> about that. Um, my 18 year old self was quite angry that someone would ask me a question like that before talking with me about it first or um, giving me the answer. And so I wrote down something uh, that was very wrong, <laughs> but it, I was also really embarrassed that I didn't know what the soul was or what it did because the faith tradition that I came from talked about souls a lot. And I thought, well, what am I doing talking about a soul when I don't know what it is? And then the study of psychology, psychology is the study of the soul. So what am I doing studying psychology if I can't say what it is? This initiated about a 10 year long personal study of the soul, what it was, what it did, um, how it worked, all of that. And I now have a new three by five card, uh, often sits out on my desk at Larksong that says, the definition of the soul and its function. And so in this month's lead to serve um, segment, you get a little bit of that definition, a little bit of its function, but generally our soul is the essence of our aliveness. It's inextricably linked to our identity and it's a fifth dimension of our personhood. So if we think about body, mind, heart, spirit, our soul is the fifth one and each of those other dimensions have distinct functions and features and purposes and so does the soul. So our soul's distinct function is to organize those other elements, those other dimensions of ourselves into wholeness and to live out that wholeness in um, the present moment. So when I think about that, and I, when I think about the experience of living life in an aligned state of present wholeness, that makes me think about the well-being facet of engagement. So that's what I want to talk about next. In the Perma Plus Me uh, wheel and the Perma Plus Me model for well-being that we use at Larksong, engagement is the first E. So engagement is this experience in which someone fully deploys their wholeness like skills strengths attention to a challenging task in front of them and when we practice engagement in that way 
we begin to experience something called flow. And flow can be experienced in a lot of different activities. It can be experienced in good conversation, um, a work task, if you play musical instruments, hiking, reading a book, building furniture, basically anything that's a task <laughs> that you can actively do can become a flow experience when your entire self is engaged with it and when your capacity meets this sweet spot of it being challenging but not unattainable for you. So um, flow, this concept of flow has been around in positive psychology since the late 1980s, early 1990s, and the leading um, psychologist in the study of flow is a man named Mihai Csikszent Mihai. And in 1990, he published a book. It's kind of an iconic work called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. In it, he outlines what the conditions are for us to experience flow. Uh, and here's where I go to my notes. So conditions for flow are clear goals, <clears throat> ones that you're pursuing, challenge, uh, when your skills are sufficient to meet a task. Concentration, because flow follows our focus. Feedback, uh, this kind of feedback has to be immediate and connected to your progress toward the goal. Uh, another condition is effortlessness. Uh, so your body and mind um, have to be equipped through talent, strength, skill, or committed practice in this area so that when you engage in the task, you can achieve a level of effortlessness. Uh, control, which basically just means the person in the flow experience has full agency. They're completely at choice um, in their environment. And then selflessness and timelessness. Selflessness isn't self-sacrifice. What it is, is a lessening of self-awareness. So uh, you kind of drop out of your prefrontal cortex and into your limbic system. So you're not as aware of yourself in the context of the environment and other people. You're fully absorbed in the task. Um, and then timelessness is this, if you've heard people say, oh, time just flew by, or I completely lost track of time, that's usually because they were engaged in a flow experience. So their concentration is completely absorbed in the present moment, and their perception of time in retrospect is distorted. Okay, so how do we then measure these flow experiences other than just in hindsight saying, hey, yeah, that was kind of a peak moment of aliveness or... Um, I lost track, lost track of time there. Well, we're finding that we can measure, ha, we can measure flow in our bodies through uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, so fMRIs, through EEG technology, and also through electromyographic technology. So uh, el electromyographic technology is basically the same thing as an EEG, which is applied to your head, right? or an EKG, which would be applied to your heart. An EMG is applying that same technology to um, study electrical signals in any muscular area of your body. And so what we know is when we're in a state of flow, what happens is we can measure what's called corticomuscular coherence. So cortico is your cortex and muscular are your muscles. Coherence is this sense of alignment um, and connectedness between the two. So if you're experiencing corticomuscular coherence, which basically means the messages that the cortical motor areas of your brain are communicating to your muscles is happening with a sense of fluidity, rapidity, and ease. You're your messaging from those areas isn't getting stuck anywhere. It's going straight from your cortex uh, motor areas into those muscles that are needed to perform the flow task. It's not getting stuck 
back and forth. It's just flowing with this sense of coherence, which I think is just so cool um, in terms of what's happening in our body when we're experiencing a state of flow and when our soul is doing its job, when our soul is functioning by organizing all of these elements of us into wholeness, our mind, our heart, our body, our spirit. Um, the other thing that happens in our brains when we experience flow is uh, kind of two things. One that deals with the electrical activity in your brain and one that deals with the chemical activity in your brain. So the electrical activity in your brain when you're going about normal waking life is usually in a beta wave. So this is kind of a spiky, fast and furious um, electrical signal that you could pick up on an EEG. Um, but when you enter in this, to a state of flow, that electrical signal um, steadies and calms into an alpha wave, which is a steady, um, smooth, more free flowing electrical signal. And in this alpha state, the noise that's usually generated in your nervous system by this constant neural firing, um, dolens it actually lessens and in that sense literally creates more headspace for fewer connections but deeper connections to yourself your present moment what you're doing in that present moment and how you're experiencing so we shift from this kind of hyper electrical activity to hypo activity which dramatically increases our ability to focus and concentrate. But our focus and concentration isn't primarily coming from our prefrontal cortex, which is where it normally comes from when we're engaged in conscious focused thought. In states of flow, um, our prefrontal cortex recedes its dominance over to um, these subcorticals. So the, fun the structures beneath the cortex, the subcortical um, brain regions. So it shifts from this serial, uh, sequential, slower processing where we are aware of what we're thinking, we're aware of what we're doing, we're focused on it, we're kind of dictating it into a very fast kind of parallel processing in the limbic regions where we're not, we're not thinking about things in the same way. Um, so we're sparking new, creative, spontaneous connections between information and events. And now moving into the, what's happening chemically, that, uh, those new creative, spontaneous connections between information and events also, um, release a surge of this cocktail of neurochemicals, uh, neurotransmitters and hormones that sharpen our abilities and create optimum performance conditions for us. So uh, dopamine you might've heard of is one of those that gets released. It's our kind of feel good chemical um, and it's connected to pleasure, but it's pretty short lasting. And then this one I have trouble pronouncing sometimes, but anan, <laughs> it's spelled A-N-A-N-D-A-M-I-D. And in Damada, and in Damada, uh, is a neurotransmitter that I'm obviously just learning about, and it is an endocannabinoid. So uh, sounds like cannabis for a reason. It's a naturally produced opiate in the body that's not externally sourced. It comes from within yourself, and it's sometimes called the bliss molecule um, because ananda means joy, bliss, or happiness. Um, and it's involved in pain modulation, basically what pain to pay attention to, mood regulation, and it has anti-anxiety and antidepressant properties, which is why we generally aren't sad or like um, debilitatingly stressed when we're in a state of flow. Uh, and Andromeda is also associated with neurogenesis, this birth of new cells, which is why sometimes when we experience flow states, we then are like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing things in a new way. I'm experiencing things in a new way. I learned all of this so quickly because um, you actually have the birth of new neural cells in your nervous system. Very exciting. 
uh, serotonin and endorphin. Serotonin is a mood stabilizer, it helps us to regulate emotions and control sleeping and waking patterns, those sorts of things. And then endorphins, many of you have already heard about, and um, they they give us this state of euphoria, also block pain, um, and are often released through exercise and other eudaimonic well-being interventions. But one that I think is really interesting is that norepinephrine is also released uh, during flow states. And typically norepinephrine is considered a stress uh, hormone. It's usually released with cortisol and adrenaline uh, when we're in a flight or fight, flight or fight state. Uh, but it gets to be released on its own when you're in a flow state which is so cool because it gives us this lift by activating our senses and um, yeah, our body so that we are feeling like, like we can connect to all of our senses and everything that is happening in both our mind, heart, body, spirit, all at the same time. And this is typically when you ask somebody um, to share with you a peak experience or a moment of aliveness as a memory, whether it's when you're developing a life purpose statement with them or in some other coaching um, experience, that they can immediately tell you what that was, they have clarity of memory. They can tell you what all their senses were experiencing at that time because norepinephrine, yay, right? Okay, so based on this information about the soul and about flow states in this practice, this well-being practice of engagement, what do we do as coaches to more fully engage our souls, our clients' souls in the work that they're doing and hopefully um, create habitats, if you will, for greater, um, more frequent flow experiences. And there are a few, a few different things that you can do. Definitely um, pay attention to embodiment. So when you are coaching, um, make sure that you ask questions that go to the person's body, their heart, their mind, and their spirit. And if you can be sure to focus on the whole person in that way by specifically focusing on those different dimensions of them, then their soul will show up more readily to organize and connect the dots between those four things. Another thing that you can do is saboteurs and imposters stop flow and soul work in its tracks. So saboteur awareness can be really important when you're coaching with the soul. Also finding the voices that replace the saboteur. So the inner witness, um, guided imagining gives you access to that. If you even ask your client, what does the old wise soul part of you have to say about this when you've identified that the saboteur has shown up? Um, and there's one additional tool in the coaching resources on the CoLab called the 360. This tool is homework that you can give your client or that they can do in session with you that helps them access their internal resources that um, call their forth, beckon their soul forth to show up. So those are a few different things that you can do in your practice, most importantly, make space for yourself um, to experience flow and um, for your soul to show up as a coach.